going to be talking about how that fits with uh, our conversation this morning in, in just a, a few moments. Uh, I've had another, a number of people already uh, commenting this morning on my attire. Uh, let me just explain something to you. Last night we had the opportunity to go to the Notre Dame football game. And uh, there were lots of Hail Marys being offered up. Uh, there were lots of uh, singing to Notre Dame, right, my fair lady. And at one point, I, I leaned over to my brother-in-law and I said, yeah, but the Reformation's coming. <laughs> and you know what? As Andrew has already said, this morning marks the 504th anniversary of where Martin Luther nailed it, Right? The 95 Theses to the door in uh, Wittenberg, Germany, setting forth uh, what we know as the, the Protestant Reformation. And I know that as we've already been talking about, you've already been probably thinking to yourself, wow, you guys seem really jazzed about this this morning. It seems like it's maybe our personal like high holy days uh, in the life of the church that here we are. But really, that's what we do. As we come together this morning, what we are doing is we are remembering this movement that began 504 years ago on this very day. Now, we have to remember that the goal of the early reformers was not to separate from the Roman Catholic Church. Their desire was really to reform it according to what, well, now what are we talking about? Let me explain it this way. The previous denomination that we just came out of is called the Reformed Church in America. Oftentimes when I would tell people that, they would say, well, what are you Reformed from? Uh, it just seems like when you think of reform, it seems like a reform school. That's where you send naughty children to. And so you think to yourself, what is this all about? And you'd always have to explain, no, 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 it's not Reformed from, it's Reformed according to the Word of God. And so ultimately, that was the goal of the early reformers was to say, no, we don't want to separate from, we want to reform ourselves according to the word of God. What they felt was that it was about this relationship with Jesus plus something else. And the reformers were saying, no, 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 it's not about Jesus plus these rules and regulations or Jesus plus these other things. It's really just about Jesus. And so when Martin Luther and then the reformers that followed began to protest, right, the Protestant, when they were protesting the things that they saw in the life of the church, they were saying, well, wait a second, it's not about, you know, going to a priest and making confession for your sin and then having some absolution that's given to you. It's really just simply about going to Jesus himself. This idea that you can, like, pay penance in order to have your sins forgiven, that's not anywhere in Scripture. And so that just doesn't seem like something that we find in Scripture. Then other things like this idea of, paying money in order to have a soul be sprung from purgatory? Well, why should the rich have any easier access to heaven than the poor would have? And so all of this was really this, this idea happening in the life of, of the Protestant Reformation. And really what we, what we say are the five solas of the Protestant Reformation. It's Scripture alone, faith alone, grace alone, in Christ alone, for the glory of God alone. I want to be clear, none of this is meant to, to denigrate our Catholic brothers and sisters in Christ. It's not to pit Protestants against Catholics in, in any way, but really it's to give you a history and an understanding of the Protestant Reformation to, so that we understand the foundations, if this is a sermon series on foundations, the foundations upon which we are standing together as a church. You know, if you think of the Apostles' Creed that we've been studying together over the course of the past couple of weeks as the foundation of the church universal, it's the themes of the Reformation that we kind of form our building and our structure. So maybe you look at the bulletin this morning and you're wondering, okay, 
why then a sermon title called Sin Boldly? Right? That seems a, a little bit awkward. Let me, let me give you just a little illustration. A couple of weeks ago, we had an opportunity to go and witness my cousin being married. And while they were there, instead of having a cake, they served ice cream. And it happened to be from one of our favorite places when we lived up in Michigan uh, called Captain Sundays. Right? Think of it like Ritter's here. Like just really, really good ice cream. And they had a turtle sundae. And even though I, we're on a diet, it was like, Oh, but it's going to be so good. And, and my uncle, who's a retired minister, said, Aaron, sin boldly. <laughs> and I was like, all right, all right, Jerry, Uncle Jerry, I will. But where does this come from? Well, this actually comes to quote from Martin Luther. But the full quote is actually this. It says, be a sinner and let your sins be strong or sin boldly, but let your trust in Christ be stronger and rejoice in Christ who is the victor over sin and death in the world. Now, I know it seems like an odd statement. Luther isn't saying, well, yes, go and sin. Really, what he's doing is condensing what we see in Scripture. And in Romans chapter 5, verse 20 through 6-2, this is what Paul says. The law was brought in so that the trespass might increase, but where sin increased, grace increased all the more, so that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? Paul says, by no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? And in verse 11, Paul says, in the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. In the end... The Protestant Reformation was really about grace instead of a focus on the law. A focus on a relationship with Jesus Christ as opposed to following a religion. And that's really what these opening videos are meant to spur thoughts towards. This morning the video was about can you have a personal relationship with God. And see, we live in a culture where people are wondering, I don't know. And what they see is people who make it about a religion. And so they say to themselves, why would I want something like that? We ask ourselves questions like, well, can I really know God personally? Can I really have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? Is it really possible that even though our sin is great, that God's grace is even greater? Is it possible that either unknowingly or unknowingly we sin boldly, that we don't need to live in fear? Or because we know that we have died to sin and we are alive with Christ? Or is it really just a matter that God is impersonal and that God really can't be known? Are we really just following after some religion? And sadly, I think what happens is a lot of people in our society look at this and they think, man, we, you're just following a whole bunch of, of rules and, and regulations. They, they think of Christianity as just really a bunch of thou shalt not. But see, if we look at Christianity and the Christian life as if we're just simply following a religion, then we're really missing out on the whole point that it's really about a relationship. And it's about a relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, don't get me wrong. This isn't to say that we don't follow rules, that there aren't commands that God gives to us. You know, but it's not a matter that God is such a killjoy that he doesn't want us to have any fun. God gives us commands of how to live out of love. 
You know, oftentimes we, we blend the traditional and the contemporary. If we were in an extremely traditional type of reformed church service, the order of worship would go something like this. There's a votum. There's the sentences. There's the salutation. Now, what's all that? It's a service would begin. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. And the congregation would respond and say, amen. There'd be some scripture that's recited back and forth, similar to we do. And then you have a welcome and a greeting. And after that, then you have this hymn. And after the hymn, then you have the confession of sin, the assurance of pardon, the giving of the law, the, another hymn, and then the sermon is preached. Now, the reason why I say all of this is because you would think in your minds that the law should come first before the confession of sin. Because the law is given for us to know how bad we are, how sinful we are. And well, surely because we don't measure up to God's standards, that's why we need to confess our sins and have an assurance of pardon given. But the reformers actually put the law after the assurance of pardon because it was a means of grace. It was a way of saying God loves us so much that he gives us his law. Not because he's a killjoy, not because he doesn't want us to have any fun, but because he says, hey, look, if you want a life that makes sense, don't follow after other gods. And follow only after me. You want a, a life that's not just about work, work, work. Well, guess what? Honor the Sabbath day. And keep it holy. Have a day that's set aside for worship. You know, if, if you want a happy home, don't cheat on your spouse. Right? Don't want what your other neighbors have. And so what we understand is that God gives us these rules and these regulations, all of these commands as an act of his grace. But I think what can sometimes happen is we struggle with that because what we see in, in the life of the church so often is this focus on the rules. And people can feel sometimes like it's very hypocritical, right? That it's all about following all of these regulations. And sometimes you can go into a church and you just feel like it's just a, a bit off. Right? There's just something where they're focusing on these things that don't really seem to matter. It's, it seems like there's this focus more on religion and religiosity rather than on relationship. And that's what we have to understand when, when it comes to what we are celebrating and remembering today, All Hallows' Eve. It's really to say this is a focus on the relationship that we are called to have with Jesus Christ. So the question is, how, how do we do that? How do we move past religiosity and towards a relationship? How do we know what we are for as a church rather than what we are against? Well, thankfully, Scripture shares with us what it is that we are for. And so if you've got your Bibles handy, I'd love to have you open to Galatians chapter 1. We're going to be spending some time there together this morning. Uh, so I want to invite you to keep your Bibles handy because we're going to keep looking at Galatians chapter 1 as well as chapter 2. But I want to pick up at the sixth verse. Let's hear what it says. Paul says this, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into, con into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. I want to stop there. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, I pray that as we unpack these truths together this morning, that ultimately what we would know is, what does it mean for us to have a relationship with you? One where it's not just a matter of following rules and regulations, but, but Lord, to experience a relationship with you, knowing, Lord, that it's because of and by and through your grace and that faith that we have, and Lord, knowing that it is all a gift that you've given to us. So Lord, what we pray is 
that you would open our eyes and our ears and our hearts so that we may know you more deeply this morning. And we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to set the stage for what it is that we just read together. Uh, you have to go back. Uh, Paul establishes the Church of Galatia somewhere around maybe about 46 to maybe about 48 AD. And what he does, he has a, a similar uh, thing that he does in just about every church that, uh, or area, community that he goes into. He goes in and he uh, begins to preach the gospel. And people begin to come to faith in Jesus Christ. And then as they come to faith in Christ, then he raises up some elders and some leaders in the life of the church in order to take that on. And then after he's established this church and these leaders, then he goes on and he establishes another church somewhere else. And he just kind of repeats this process. Well, what happens in this case is as Paul goes away to plant another church, he, he finds out that there is this group of people known as the Judaizers who have come in after him. Now, you can imagine that Judaizers are Jewish, and what they're doing is they're saying, look, Paul was a good guy. He preached some good things, but he's also missing out on a few things. They were saying, look, it's about Jesus, but you also have to be circumcised. Now, you can imagine that this could potentially be a hindrance to people who are coming to faith. I mean, imagine if we give this altar call and we invite you to come forward and to be baptized, right? And, you know, die and rise and, you know, that picture. But instead of that, I said, come on forward and I'm going to greet you with a flint knife and a band-aid, Right? That's probably a hindrance to some people who would say, yeah, I'd be willing to do that and, and come forward. And what Paul is saying is, he's saying, no, 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 look, these Judaizers have made it about something else. It's not just about following Jesus plus all of these other things. What he's saying is you're taking what is good news and you're actually making it bad news for people. It's not Jesus plus these other things, not Jesus plus all of these other rules that you have to follow. And so what Paul does is he goes on to explain how actually I look at this as being somebody who was like the Jew of Jews. Like if you continue on in chapter one, he begins to explain how he was a religious like a zealot, and he followed after this faith. He tried to live it out to the fullest, but it was only when he met Jesus Christ that he discovered what it means to have a personal relationship. And this is what the reformers were really trying to get to. They felt that the church had abandoned the gospel and it turned to another one, which he says is no good news at all. Paul finally gets to the point in Galatians chapter 2, verse 16. He says this, A person is not justified by works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus that we may be justified by faith faith in Christ and not by works of the law, because by works of the law, no one will be justified. So in the next couple of moments, what does it take for us to take a relationship and to turn it into a religion? A couple of thoughts. The first is this, when we focus on the external rather than the internal, okay? You know, we can take this relationship and turn it into a religion if we focus on the external rather than the internal. See, if you don't make it about a relationship with Jesus Christ, what's left? The show. What's left is the external, what people can see. And that's what's happening as Paul wrote this. People were trying to reduce Christianity down to a bunch of rules of do's and don'ts. And, and you've got this group of people who are called the Pharisees. And we know that Jesus often gives the Pharisees a hard time. And here's the thing, the Pharisees can sometimes get a bad rap. It doesn't mean that they were all necessarily bad. They were trying to live good and holy lives. The problem was 
that's what they had reduced this religion down to, was about following all of these rules and regulations. They got caught up in the external rather than the internal. So instead of just having the Ten Commandments that we would follow, they had 613 other laws and commands by which they had to live by. And they would go around memorizing all of these different laws and these different regulations. And the problem is, not only did they memorize them, but they wanted to make sure that everybody else around them knew that they had memorized them as well. So they would wash their hands in public in a certain way, right? They, they would pray in a certain way. They would dress in a certain way. And what they were trying to do is to let everyone else know how they were doing, and they looked down on everybody else. The thing is, Jesus could see right past all of this. In Matthew chapter 23, verse 25, Jesus says, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites you clean the outside of the cup and dish but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence now you've heard me joke about this before but i want to give you a little explanation of what this potentially can look like and uh, i'm grateful i'm grateful that i grew up in a home where uh, we we loved jesus i was taught about jesus from a very early age uh, but we also were a part of a church where it was important that you follow the rules and the regulations. And, and especially, it, it became almost, I would say, like a, a focus. And one of the ways in which that it, you experienced that was on, like, Sundays, right? So, like, if you were at least called yourself a Christian, you came on Sunday morning, right? But, like, the real Christians came Sunday night, all right? So you came back to church at night but then like the if you were really if you were really like the separating the wheat the chaff if you, if you were really good you came to the wednesday night stuff too right the the problem is i can remember in 1985 when the chicago bears you know won the super bowl the year that 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 sunday afternoon it was a big deal that my dad and i got to stay home from church while my mom went to church that night in order to represent our family, right? Because this was a big deal. The problem is that when you make it about the rules and the regulations, I mean, would our relationship with Jesus be any less if, a fa if our family decided, no, you know what, we can actually stay home. It's okay, it'll be okay. But the thing is, is, the external makes you think about, well, what are everybody else going to think about us, right? And, and this is what Jesus is, is getting at. Now, some of you, I'm guessing, if you've grown up in the church, you've probably experienced something like this along the way. You know that we kind of judge other people based on what we think they should or shouldn't be doing, based on the rules that we've established at, at our own church. And what Jesus reminds us of is that this sort of thinking is actually toxic. That when we focus on a religion rather than, an, than a relationship, that this is not good news. If Jesus is good news in and of himself, why would we pollute the good news with all kinds of other things? We shouldn't. And I don't believe that this is what God desires from us. So we have to say, I'm not going to focus on the external. I have to focus on where my own heart is in all of this. Second, any foundation that promotes spiritual pride. They're, they're related to each other. You know, that if you're going to build a foundation on spiritual pride, Galatians chapter 1 in verse 14, Paul talks about his own upbringing. I was already referencing this. He says, I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people and was extremely zealous for the traditions of my fathers. Paul had a pride in who he was, and it caused him to look down his nose at other people. And 
By the way, this is something that can sometimes be so prevalent in Christian circles. I'm sure all of us have been around people who come off as like better or more spiritual or more holier than thou. And they know how to speak the language, right? If you're on Facebook, you'll see it. You know, or if you're around town, it's all about the Christianese. And they know how to speak that Christianese type of language. And they talk one way when they're in church on Sunday. And then they talk a totally different way when they're outside of church and they're surrounded by other people. What you can often find is people that just oftentimes come off as so judgmental. By the way, th this drove Jesus crazy as well. All you have to do is look at Scripture, go to places like Luke chapter 18 and verses 9 to 14. Jesus shares this example of two people who go up to the temple to pray. One's a tax collector and one's a Pharisee. And the tax collector goes, he can't even look up towards heaven. He's like looking down, he's beating his chest, and he's saying, like, Lord, I'm messed up. My life is a mess. I'm a terrible sinner. Like, God, would you forgive me? And then you've got the Pharisee who goes up. It's the external show, right? And he's like, God, I'm thanking you that I'm not like this guy right here. Like, I give a tenth of all I get. Like, I, I fast twice a day. Like, I'm doing pretty well. And the thing is, maybe he actually was. Like, maybe he really was a good, like, guy, problem was Jesus saying that it's pride. The one that was forgiven was the one who asked, the one who said, you know what, my life is messed up and I need help. And so what we have to remember is that it's not about the external show. It's not about pride. It's about a relationship. You know, one of the things that, uh, one of the things that I've found as we've moved to this community and as I've interacted with people is when I tell them that I'm the pastor at Presby, I've heard more than once that they would say, oh, that's the country club church. <laughs> now, I don't, I don't think that that's the way it is anymore. I don't, I don't think it's been that way for a long time. But I think it was the idea that, that, well, that's where all the people who had influence, that's where all the people who had money go, that's, that's like this extra, it just, that was the feeling about it. And, and so I'm just going to remind us, we're not going to have any Presbyterian pride, right? We're not going to have a, a socioeconomic pride. We're not going to say that we're going to look at other people based on like what they do or the color of their skin or where they are in their own spiritual journeys. Whenever we act in that way, I think people look at the church and say, well, why would I want to be a part of something like that? That's, that's joyless and that's lifeless. I don't want to give people a reason to say that about us. So what does it look like for us to make sure that we're not focusing on religion, that we are focused on relationship? First is this. It's grounded in revelation. We want to have a relationship that's grounded in revelation. Now, what does this mean? What Paul is saying is that it's not based in human reasoning. It's not anything that you can explain. It, people thought in Paul's day and sometimes in our day that if I just work at it hard enough, if I just do enough, then somehow I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to earn a spot in heaven. Like if I just do enough of these good things, if you just follow the law enough and read your Bible enough, if you just give enough money, then, then God will punch your ticket and say, welcome to heaven. Now, I don't know what that looks like. I mean, maybe for us, the rules are I, I will not watch things like rated R movies or, you know, I won't swear if I miss the golf shot or I make sure I'm nice to my kids. I don't know what it is, right? It's probably something different for every single one of us. But the point is, if we in any way think that it's about the way in which we follow the rules, and if I can just do enough of these good things, that that's what gets me back to God. And even in Paul's day, people were facing this. People were saying, well, he shouldn't be listened to because he's really not a proper disciple of Christ. I mean, he didn't walk with Jesus. He didn't talk with Jesus. He didn't learn from Jesus. And now Paul is preaching to Gentiles. And we know that Jesus only came for Jewish people. And so you can imagine that in Paul's day, there's a lot of this human reasoning that's kind of going on. 
But what Paul says is that it is not about human reasoning. It's not about a religion for Jewish people only. It is about a direct revelation. In fact, in verses 11 to 12, Paul says this, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel I preached is not of human origin. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. I want you to miss what he's saying here. It is all about Jesus Christ being revealed to him. He's saying it's all about a personal relationship. Human reasoning says I can do something to earn my way back to God. But what Paul says is that it's about faith in Jesus Christ. Receiving this free gift of God's grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Religion says that we have to live in guilt, that we have to do more. And in fact, in verse 13, Paul says this, For you have heard of my previous way of life in Judaism, how intensely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. Think about it. What he's saying is that religion caused me to try to attack the church. It's religion that caused me to try to attack Jesus Christ himself. It's religion that kept me caught up in in rule following and traditions. It kept me from experiencing God's best for me. What Paul came back to is this truth. It is about a relationship grounded in Jesus. That's what we want to be about, a relationship that is grounded in Jesus. Paul says, once I entered into this relationship with Jesus Christ, everything changed. That if you ultimately, if you want to be made right with God, it is about faith in Jesus Christ alone. Religion reminds us that we are broken, sinful people. It focuses on guilt And either you've dealt with this or you know people who deal with this, who they walk around and they're just feeling guilty all the time. And maybe you've just felt the the joylessness and the exhaustion of trying to follow after a religion. God wants to set you free from all that. He wants you to experience a relationship with Jesus Christ. Look, look at what Paul says in Ephesians 2, 8 to 9. I mean, this is the rallying cry of the Reformation. For it is by grace that you are saved through faith. And it is not from yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. What great news is that? It's Jesus Christ plus nothing. Not Christ plus circumcision, not Christ plus church membership, not Christ plus how much money you give to church, not Christ and how good you feel about yourself. Righteousness with God comes by faith in Christ and Christ alone. Doesn't matter if you've doubted, doesn't matter if you've messed up, it doesn't matter If you've never been in church before or if you've been in church your entire lives, it's about giving your life over to Jesus and then knowing that the past is in the past. You don't have to live there any longer. Jesus has set you free. And ultimately, that is what the Reformation was all about. And that's what we want to be about together as a church. Because here's the point, that if our faith is built on the Apostles' Creed, but then the structure that is built upon it is is framed by rules and by religion and about the external show, then guess what? At some point, it's going to collapse. And the Reformers, and we would say, it should collapse. Because it can't stand in that way. Because if it's about us and our doing it, it's actually opposed to the things of the gospel. 
Because that, what that does is it puts salvation in our own hands instead of in the hands of God. Understanding we are not in control, but ultimately it is about Jesus who is in control. Yes, we stand together on the foundation of the Apostles' Creed, but the structure that we build it out of must always be about embracing the love and the grace of God through Jesus Christ our Lord and saying yes to having a relationship with Him. And so today, as we remember All Hallows' Eve, Maybe yesterday and today, as you're giving out candy that, in reality, is completely unmerited, right? You know, no, no kid deserves it. We just do it. Guess what? Remember this, that the grace we have received is unmerited. We didn't do anything to deserve it. It is freely given to us through our Lord Jesus Christ. So instead, happy, happy Reformation Day. Because here's the good news. While we may sin, and our sin may sometimes be great, the grace of Jesus is even greater. And that's what we stand upon. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you that on this day, we don't stand on anything we do but we stand on the grace that has been shown us in Christ Jesus. Lord, we thank you that we place our faith in him, that, Lord, you have called us, that you have redeemed us, that you have restored us, and that, Lord, this morning we can stand on you. Lord, if any of us this morning feel the weight of guilt and feel, Lord, how we're in this place of having to do something that, Lord, we would understand that it's already been done and that the work has been finished and that Christ is indeed the victor. Lord, what we would pray is that this day we would either come to that place of knowing you in relationship or, Lord, growing in you in that relationship and that, Lord, we would be freed to live for you in everything that we do, not because of something that we feel like we have to do to follow a rule, but because we say, Lord, I want to do these things because I love you, knowing that you have loved me first. And so, Lord, today we thank you for the grace and the hope that we have in Jesus. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen and amen. Friends, let's stand as we close and sing together.